UFC Fight Night Cannoneer versus Imovov is going down Saturday, June 8th at the KFC Center in Louisville, Kentucky. We have got prospects. We have got veterans. We have got rankings on the line. We got haircuts. All that and more coming up on the Fight Pit. Welcome back into the Fight Pit, everybody. My name is Kyle. I am joined by the full crew. We have got Gage. We have got Sean. We've got Drew. We have got Matt. Everybody is here to talk about UFC Fight Night Cannoneer versus Imovov going down Saturday, June 8th at the KFC Center. Before we get to that, I have got to shout out our amazing sponsor at Pillow Fight. Listen, if you are anything like me, you have got to have the right pillow to fall asleep. Luckily, Pillow Fight is that right pillow. I am talking about the difference between tossing and turning at night and sleeping like you just got punched on the chin by Jared Cannonier. So get yourself to Pillow Fight. Get your sleep right. It is the best way to tackle your day. We all know it. We need more sleep. We need better sleep. So get yourself to Pillow Fight. And thank you to Pillow Fight for sponsoring this episode now. We've got a fun one. This this fight card flies under the radar just a little bit, but if you know where to look on this one, there are some really, really exciting matchups. We have got the entire main card to preview and some undercard fighters and fights to keep an eye on. Kicking us off, we have got some 170-pound action between Miguel Baeza and Punahele Soriano. That is the best I'm going to do on that one. I'm going to throw it right to Gage to talk about these welterweights. So uh, they are both coming off losing streaks. Uh, Miguel actually came in professionally at, I believe it was 7-0 or no into the UFC, won his first three, and then now has not won a fight since his first loss. So he's on a three-fight skid, counting for all three of his losses. On the other side, uh, Punal... Oof, I'm going to butcher that. Soriano. Yeah, Let's just go last name here. Soriano. Um, <laughs> is also coming off rough losses and his what i've noticed is fights and looking at the stats and his takedown defense is terrible awful giving up takedowns at over 70 percent clip um which is not what you want if you're going to mixed martial arts if you like kickboxing boxing great you don't need it my problem is miguel doesn't utilize his takedowns a lot in his prior fights he can take people down he does have takedowns he does have submission wins I would like to see him use it more and get back in the win column. And I think that's what his camp is going to be focused on and seeing past fights and being seeing Soriano's poor takedown defense. Because I think if he gets into the ground, he can easily submit him. Bet-wise, Soriano wins by decision more often than not. And Miguel loses by decision every single time. Besides one, one random. So I think he got knocked out his last fight. That was the only one. Um, every fight he wins, stop does not go to the cards. So I'm going to go ride that train. I'm going to say submission round two, Miguel Baeza. There Hopefully it is. he wants that takedown, gets into the ground, date, and just picks him apart and just keeps him there. No, I like it. I like it quite a bit. Baeza by submission, because, I mean, like you said, he's a finisher. He does not like the score cards. Sprinkle a little bit of, you know, Soriano for decision, because that can always still happen. But Baeza by submission, really, really like that. We are going to go up one weight class. We're going to talk about some middleweights for a little bit. We've got Julian Marquez taking on Zachary Reese. These odds are basically dead even. Sean, break down some middleweight action for us, brother. So I don't agree that these odds even should be this close. I think there is a clear-cut winner in this fight, but I'll explain a little bit here. Julian Marquez, 9-4, 6 KOs and 3 subs. Zachary Reese, 6-1, 4 KOs, 2 subs. The easiest bet to make on this will be not going the distance because that's all these guys do is get finishes. <clears throat> now back to Julian Marquez. He, his last two fights, he's lost by KO, TKO, and he hasn't fought in 15 months, which could be a good thing, could be a bad thing, depending on the fighter. Uh, he's 6'2", 34 years old. He does have the better clinch work of the two fighters, and he's more experienced in the UFC, but a very hittable chin. And we haven't really seen him, when someone gets on his back, how he, how he fights. Then you have Zachary Reese. Uh, he's 0-1 in the UFC, off the Dana White Contender Series. 
He fought Cody Brundage that just took uh, Bo Nickel to the second round, the first person to do that. Um, but Cody Brundage beat him by a KO by slam while locked into a triangle choke. So it looked like Zachary Reese was getting out, out of there with another submission win and then just slammed on the, mostly the shoulder, but then got the back of the neck and head and caused night night. So it was a legal slam. I see a lot of people saying that was not a legal slam, but it, it hit the shoulder first. Um, so yes, that loss is granted there. It was lucky because you could easily break your arm or neck in that state for Cody Brundage, but he got away with one. Um, Zachary Reese is 6'4", longer, 30 years old, younger. He's a better distance striker, and he will keep you at range. And then basically everywhere on the ground, I know that Julian Marquez has three submissions, but Zachary Reese's top game, on off-the-back submissions, ground and pound is phenomenal. His ground game everywhere is better, even though if you just look by submissions, that's not the case. Issue with both of these fighters is they have a very hittable chin. Uh, they both carry their chins high. It's easy to connect. And Marquez does have serious power, but Zachary Reese, I I just trust trust it more. And I, he has way more ways to win this fight, in my opinion. Uh, I don't believe the odds should be this close unless you really think there should be a KO. I don't know if this was short notice by any means. Maybe that's the reason, but... I just everything I see, and even looking at Zachary He's, Reese's history, it just it looks like Zachary Reese by finish. I'm gonna say, honestly, I'm gonna say a first round finish. He's gonna get a, I'm gonna say he's gonna get that next submission. He's gonna get a rear naked choke. He's gonna ground and pound, and then they're gonna give up the neck. Marquez is gonna give up the neck, and Zachary Reese is getting that rear naked choke. I like it. I like it quite a bit. This is a, this is a fun little submission card because we got some more grapplers. We got some more grapplers down this card, but man, Zachary. Hey, real quick, Sean. Absolute weapon. Do we have an over under for the Reese Marquez fight? Uh, I would assume it's one and a half, and I would go under because these guys they get a lot of finishes and a lot of quick finishes too. I also so. got put one under one and a half for mine as well, Drew. I'd be surprised if it if oh, yeah. it under. gets out of the first Sweet. for sure. Beautiful. No, that, that's going to be a good one. Let's stick with middleweights. Let's talk about Bruno Ferreira and Dustin Stoltzfus. This one, the, we got some back-to-back all-time names on this one. More middleweights. We've got a minus 265 favorite in Bruno Ferreira. Dustin Stolf, Stolf, Stoltzfus? I'm, I'm butchering that so hard. Is coming in at the underdog at plus 215. Matt, talk to me about how bad that last name pronunciation was. That's about as good as I can say. It's Stolzbus. But uh, Bruno Ferreira is 11 and 1. He is coming off of a knockout win against Unacelli Soriano. I definitely butchered that. He came off of a submission win. And, <clears throat> oh, sorry, that was Dustin. Uh, Dustin Stolzfist that came off of a submission win. And then Bruno Ferreira is coming off of a first round KO against Phil Host. They both look pretty decent in their last performance. But honestly, I'm going to have to go with Bruno Ferreira with this one. Nothing that Dustin has done really impressed me besides the Joe Pfeiffer win. He did knock him out in the first round. <clears throat> and I honestly don't see how Dustin is going to be able to win this. He is three and seven in his UFC fights, and I don't see this one going past the second round. I see a second round knockout for uh, his opponent, Bruno Ferreira. I like it. Br like Bruno Ferreira just has that that intimidating presence at middleweight that you just can't deny. I've, I I definitely agree with the betting line on this one. Now let's move to something that I don't agree with the betting line on. I'm talking about the Bantamweights. I'm talking about Raul Rosas Jr. coming in at minus 260 against Ricky Tercios. Now don't get me wrong, Raul Rosas Jr. is a very talented mixed martial artist. He is 8-1. and one. He's got five submissions, two knockouts. Six of those finishes are coming in the first round. Big, big-time grappler. There's no doubt about it. 3.57 on the takedown average. He's going to attempt at l at least one to two submissions in in every fight. And he's not necessarily a slouch when it comes to the striking. We just haven't seen the most striking 
out of him. He does, he does have a UFC knockout. He's only attempted 96 strikes in his UFC career. Like, we don't really have that big of a sample size with this kid. On the other side of it, Ricky Tercios, we know. This guy's awesome. He's so much fun. He was on The Ultimate Fighter. He's a personality. He is just like the he's the definition of that just like absolute mixed martial arts like encompasses the entire almost lifestyle of it coming in at 13 and three three knockouts one submission definitely more of a decision fighter he's going to just pour on the strikes absolutely a volume puncher 5.08 significant strikes landed per minute doesn't necessarily absorb a lot of strikes on the other end he's very elusive only 3.7 on significant strikes strikes absorbed per minute he will mix in takedown attempts but mostly as a way to keep opponents guessing very unorthodox kind of style with his you know blend of a lot of different disciplines very much one of my favorite fighters and the fact that he is this long of an underdog is a little bit disappointing to me because i see this fight only going raul rosas's way if he is able to get an early finish now that is absolutely possible he could take you know ricky tercios down maybe sink in a submission but like I said, Ricky Tercios, no slouch on the ground. He can defend grappling. He can tire out Raul Rosas Jr. and just pour on the strikes from a distance, throw in a few knees, throw in some uppercuts, make him make him double think going for those takedowns and be able to get his way to a decision. I'm going with Ricky Tercios by a decision. I think it's going to be 29-28. I think that Raul Rosas Jr. can absolutely take the first round, but Ricky Tercios is very good at playing possum and then absolutely bringing it in the later rounds and just nonstop pressure. So I'm going with Ricky Tercios by a decision on this one. Now, before we get to our co-main event, I have got to go throw it to Drew. He's going to take us under the radar and talk about some of those undercard fighters and fights to keep an eye on for this one. Thank you, my good man. This is uh, a card that's got a lot of good names sprinkled throughout it. None are really like upper echelon, you would say. Uh, Jared Cannonier is fought for the title. Imovov is, you know, he's getting there. He's getting there. Um, but on the undercard, there are so a lot of recognizable names that have been doing some some big stuff lately uh within their last fights uh opening up we got ray Ando santos going up against uh puha tomar she's making her ufc debut so we have a debutante in the first fight uh next fight up cody stamen been around for quite a while 21 6 and 1 going up against taylor lapalus which is who's 19 and 4 which is a, gonna be a sweet fight very off, uh, very rarely does Cody Stamen have like a boring fight. He's kind of developed into like one of those. I'm I'm going for it from the get go. Uh, oh, I've been at uh, exactly. He's he's been in the UFC long enough to know that he needs to make it. Kind of have that Justin Gaethje mindset. You need to make it a fight. You need to make it exciting. You can't just sit around trying to outpoint people. You're not going to get very far. Um, the uh the next fight we have eduarda mora versus denise gomez uh mora is 10 and 0 undefeated the next fight also john castaneda and daniel marcos daniel marcos is 15 and 0 he's undefeated so those will be uh those will be ones to keep your eyes on brad katona another ultimate fighter guy two-time ultimate fighter uh contestant been around for a while as well he's 15 and 3. he has one KO win, three submission wins, nine decision wins. So on that fight, I'm I'm definitely going to throw Brad Katona by decision on uh, throw a little bit on that. Then uh, Andrea Lee versus Montana De La Rosa, both just you can't help but not love either of those. They've been around for a while. They've been they've been exciting. They've been in the rankings. They both come to fight they're both very well rounded uh sweet fight on that one too then mm, the one that i'm personally looking forward to the most charles radke um i'm not going to repeat why he is uh 
<laughs> controversial and and uh, always like must see TV. Um, but you're gonna want to hear his post fight speech if he wins. Absolutely, uh, he's coming off of a, a, a KO win, going up against Carlos Paredes, who's 18 and six. Excellent, you know, prelim co-main. And then Tiago Moises. Everybody knows Tiago Moises. 18 and 7, 4 KO wins, 8 submission wins, 6 decision wins. Uh, up, going up against Lud Ludovic Klein. We got some names on this one, man. 21, 4, and 1. And oh, we didn't. I'm surprised I got I got as far as I did without stumbling on these. Um, but yeah, Tiago Moises in the prelim main event. He's definitely must see TV as well. Uh, not a bad prelim for a fight night. Absolutely. Uh, there's going to be some finishes. I haven't quite figured out who. Uh, I might be taking Tiago Moises and Radke by finish or within the distance. You could... Could see Cody Stamen getting. I mean, like I said, he's he's working like a firecracker these days. So he's. I think either his last fight or the fight before he finished it in like thirty seconds or he's something like that. Um, he had a real fast. Yeah. He had a real fast finish. He's man. He's he's skilled. He's he's a tough dude. He's built like a freaking pit bull. So you know he's he's built for charging forward against you know against stuff. So might take Cody Stamen inside the distance. Might take Radke. Might take Moises inside the distance. Uh, but I like Moises. I like Radke. I like uh, Katona and I like Stamen. If we're looking for uh, for a prelim parlay for you and. Uh, that is that there you have it we are back above the radar i love it that's it's a good undercard on this one like this this is what i mean this one this one's a little sneaky flies under the radar a little bit but that's why we take you under the radar just 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 make sure you know that there's some good stuff on those on those early prelims i mean who else is gonna bring it to you you know we watch them all so no better it. place to get it you see every single <laughs> round, people, believe you me. Before we get to our co-main, I've got to do a quick plug. We have had some amazing interviews recently that you've got to make sure you're checking out on our YouTube channel, The Fight Pit. And, gosh, I, I just can't speak highly enough of it. Jenny Savage was on. We had, obviously, the returning four-time interview champion now, Ross Levine. That guy, is three, uh, three, four? Yeah. There it is. Dude, we're getting four. We're going to get Soon to be four. I, God, I love Ross. Ross is the best. He's the man. Ross is just so, so awesome. But let's talk some more fights. This co-main event, I, uh, I've gone back and forth on this. We got some 205-pound action. We have got Dominic Reyes trying so desperately to end the losing skid against Dustin Jacoby. Dominic Reyes has been reeling ever since the title fight. We know this. Like, it has been the story of honestly two different fighters before and after him fighting john jones because the dominic reyes who fought john jones is one of the most electric and talented light heavyweights that i've seen in in this you know modern group of the top 15 but now it's just the last few fights against blahovich against prohoshka against ryan spam like Dominic Reyes has been an absolute shell of himself. He has been knocked out again and again and again. And unfortunately, Dustin Jacoby has 12 first round knockouts. He's bringing in a 19, 8, and 1 record against Dominic Reyes's very impressive, you know, don't get it twisted, 12 and 4 record. But like I said, three of those losses have come in his last three fights. I don't know where I'm going on this one, and I think that Gage is going to, you know, give me just a little bit more clarity. I mean, yeah, you segued into everything I wanted to hit. His last four fights have been his only four losses, and it comes to John Jones, then Jan Blachowicz, then Yuri Pahaska, and then Ryan Spann. Back to back to back to back. Here's where it gets bad. The last three fights have been KOs, and they just keep getting progressively getting earlier and earlier and earlier. And uglier. Yeah. Ryan Span was a minute and twenty-two seconds in to round one, and he's fighting the worst guy for that. Like it's it's hard to pick against. Again, this is a second time on this card where the guy that has a ranking that's higher is the underdog. 
but it's for good reason. Dustin Jacoby has, again, 12 first round finishes. 12. And fighting someone who's not looked great, standing up, has been put out by good competition, but Ryan Spann doesn't fit into with the other three of those guys. No. The other three have been Four world champions. champions. And to get put out in um, less than a minute and a half by Ryan Spann, who, d- good fighter, great power, not the same caliber. So Dustin Jacoby's been around for a long time. He's fought a lot of fights. Been up and down his last four fights. Win, loss, win, loss. Um, coming off a loss against Alonzo Menafield. So I'm going to look for that pattern to continue. I'm going to say the patterns continue. He wins. Dominic Reyes' KO, KO streak continues. I think Dominic, Dominic probably hangs it up. He's 34, been knocked out four times in a row. Or at Damn. least leaves the UFC. We all, God, we always call for retirements. Every I, I mean, I don't want to see it. Like, he's not old. He's just that he's how much more damage. I mean, his, his chin is compromised. It, there, there's a very realistic chance and that his chin Kobe's is compromised. Just not, not the guy for it. So I think he slips out of the rankings, such as Kobe takes 15, uh, easily under one and a half. And that's a Jacoby by fucking Shadow Realm knockout. There you have it. Sean, who you got for this one, brother? Yeah, I'm going to keep it short and sweet. Like Gage said, uh, just you got to trust the streak at this point. Dominic Reyes, chin's getting worse. It's doesn't look good for him at all. And you got the knockout artist and the first round knockout artist in Dustin Jacoby. It's going to be quick. It might even be quicker than a minute and 22. You don't even know. Let's see what happens after the first one lands. If, if the chin is there, obviously Dominic Reyes wins because he's better everywhere. He's a better pure striker, better grappler, everything. But the question is not about who's the better fighter. It's about can that chin hold? So Dustin Jacoby, first round knockout. There you have it. That's the thing about streaks. They tend to streak. Matt, who you got on this one? I'm putting the house on Dustin Jacoby. <laughs> I don't think that there's any world where Dominic Reyes comes back and wins this fight. Um, maybe if he has like a second uh, win, but... I don't see that happening at all. Ah, man, it's it's so disappointing, just like the rise and fall of Dominic Reyes, because it was an impressive rise, and it has been an even more impressive fall. Gage, who you got walking out with the win in our co-main? Uh, Gage has Jacoby. It's coming oh, wait, next. Jesus I was like, wait a minute. It's to be fair in your defense, we were separated at birth, so it's true. I, the, I understand. If I, I get Gage's prediction, I'll get Drew's prediction. <laughs> yeah, Gage is a handsome devil, so I can I, I do understand how you got us mixed up. Um, Matt, real quick, how does Jacoby get it done and win? First round knockout, hundred percent. Hmm. Beautiful. So we got that's three four Jacoby for a KO uh, under one and a half. I can't sit here and pretend like I'm going to pick any different. I don't. It's just so it's upsetting seeing these guys, man. I mean, at one point, everybody was talking about Reyes being the dude that dethroned John Jones. Like how how insane. And now he's on a. a, as much as I love all of them involved, he's on one of those. Cody Garbrandt, Tony Ferguson, BJ Penn type of runs where it's like they just reach the pinnacle and they're right there. They're about to they're about to just hit that hit the tip of the uh the mountain and it's they just fucking slip and start rolling downhill. And it's unfortunate, man. Um but I'm gonna have to keep it keep it unanimous thus far uh i'm going with jacoby i'm i want to give reyes the uh benefit of the doubt uh i'm going to say that he makes it out of the first round but i'm still gonna pick under one and a half because i think if you know if he if he makes it out of the first round i think it's because it got to the ground somehow some way i'm not very confident in it getting to the ground but You know, if it does make it there, I don't think that it stays there too long. And if it makes it out of the first round, I don't think it makes it out of the second. 
Uh, Jacoby is just, he's too big, he's too powerful, and he's hes at that point where he's, you know, kind of turned a corner and he's ramping it up too, you know. He's, he's going for finishes. He's one of those guys that you don't expect to win, but keeps stringing wins out there, and he's, I'm, I'm, Keeping it unanimous, I'm going with Jacoby. He's getting it done under one and a half. Yeah, I tried to pretend like I didn't know I was going with it. It's 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 impossible not to pick Dustin Jacoby on this one. It's, it's you know 5.5 significant strikes landed per minute against a chin that I I fully believe is compromised at this point. You have gone against some of the hardest hands in the division. I will grant you that, but it's gotten worse and worse and worse. And I only see it getting even more bad for Dominic Reyes because he's going against, like we've said, an insanely powerful hitter in Dustin Jacoby. So we are staying unanimous on this one. We have got just one fight left to talk about. We have got the main event. We've got a couple of middleweights. Number four ranked Jared Cannonier versus number eight ranked Nasardine Imovov. Nasardin Imovov is coming in as the favorite Frenchman is currently sitting at minus 135. Jared Cannonier is at plus 115 as the narrow underdog. Jared Cannonier, of course, 10 wins by knockout, two by submission, seven first round finishes. He is coming off of an impressive couple of wins against Sean Strickland and Marvin Vittori. Jared Cannonier has fought for a title. You know, he is absolutely legit. On the other side of it, though, you have got 13 and 4, Nasser Dean Imovov, five knockouts, four submissions, seven first round finishes, an absolutely just complete mixed martial artist. He is dangerous anywhere and everywhere. Usually more of a defensive grappler, not going to shoot for a whole lot of takedowns, but can absolutely, you know, still obviously rack up those submissions. This fight is interesting. It's, you know, pretty close odds, a little bit of a favorite going to the lesser ranked opponent, which I always find interesting. Uh, Gage, who do you got going for our main event? See, this is, again, the thing. The number four is the underdog against number eight. I just keep thinking back to the Israel Asana and Jaron Cannonier fight where he just looked terrible against Izzy. Even his fights now, he's getting up there in age. I just don't think he can keep up. That being said, if you get to look for an underdog on the main card, this is probably your best chance because he does have one one right punch on the chin and he's going to put someone out. Always. I think it's a little more than a puncher's chance for Jaren Karanir. He's so much experience and has so much, you know, shout out Drew, high fight IQ. Um, I just think it's it's time for the division. The old guard's going to change out, and he's just going to be the first one to go. Dang, there you have it. We're getting a little uh, bit. To the cards. I'm going to say cards. So not the finish. I like it. I like it. I can see it. Jared Cannon here is just, he's tough as nails. He's been there. Yeah, I, I don't but... think he gets put out on the feet, and I think he can stave off. I would go over three and a half here. Yeah. And say he's able to stave it off long enough to either make it to the cards or get submitted way late in the fight. That's where I put it. It'll be interesting to see if Imovov shoots a little bit more in this fight because of the power from Jared Cannon here. That's what I'm most interested to see is how much the takedown gets mixed in by Nasser Dean Imovov. Because I don't think Jared Cannon here is going to mix in the takedown. I, like, that's not really his. It's not really his thing. Uh, Sean, who you got going for our main event? I always pick a lot of times off of their last fight and how they're looking. And I would say against Marvin Vittori might have been his best fight in his UFC career. That's really good. And the only reason that wasn't a KO because Marvin Vittori has some, some metal in that chin or something. That was ridiculous. He should have been out cold 15 different times. But he just he was a punching bag. Jared Kennear looked like he could. He was even thrown in good feints. He was the issues that he was having against like Israel Adesanya. It looked like he was fixing them, and then his ground game. The only one that's really been able to hold him down and didn't get to hold him down the whole time was Derek Brunson, and he ended up winning that fight by TKO. So, like you, you try to hold Jared Kennear down. He used to be a fat boy. He used to be a heavyweight, and so he carries that. He still has that fat boy strength in him. So, like, he 
you know, he's not going to be held down and he's going to be able to get up very easily in my opinion if the takedowns happen uh do i think those takedowns will set up strikes for Milov? yes but i i like jared cannonier here uh it's crazy with the amount of power he has that he hasn't got more knockouts recently but i I'm, i think he's going to get a tko i'm not going to say it's going to be out cold i think it's going to be like a stoppage uh, i'm going to say later though i'm going to say fourth round and Malov's going to get tired i like it i like it quite a bit matt who you got taking the co- oh main main event jeez louise people i'm gonna have to agree with sean i have jared cannonier as well i see him getting it done by decision he's proven a lot of times in the past like sean strickland and then his last one, Marvin Vittori, he can go five hard rounds. He has the cardio for this. And ultimately seeing him, he can definitely rock him on the feet. As Sean said, he's a former heavyweight, so he carries that power down. And I ultimately see it, yeah, getting done by decision. There you have it. Drew, are we, where are we going with this? Am I going to have to be the deciding person? We'll see. We'll see when we get there, boys. Uh, it's going to be a ride. You're just on it. <laughs> it. This is a tough one, man, because this is all the guys made great points too. It's definitely hard to forget about the Cannoneer Adesanya fight because you feel like that's something that he's liable to do. You know what I mean? Once they have had a fight like that, that's something like with Derek Lewis, Rose Namajunas, and Carlos Barza. Anytime somebody has a fight like that, especially somebody like Cannoneer, who's who knocks dudes dead just crazy knockouts you're always from then on you're always worried about them doing that again and uh i feel like if that is gonna happen again imavov is the type of dude that it would happen against too because he's he has ko's he has submission wins um five ko wins four submission wins so he's got more finishes than decisions but He's been a decision machine for the last couple years or so. Um, he had the fight against Chris Curtis that ended with uh, the uh, headbutt, the accidental headbutt. Other than that, Dalize fight went to a decision. Strickland fight went to a decision. Buckley fight went to a decision. Um, Phil Hawes fight went to a decision. Jordan Williams. He hasn't had a finish since november of 2021 um cannoneer also a finisher somebody that you think of in your head as a finisher his name is cannoneer like just that's that means like he's just ending dudes um <laughs> and his his fight with vittori decision strickland decision adesanya decision um kelvin gastelum robert whitaker all decisions. He hasn't had a finish since February of 2022. So I'm kind of leaning toward Imavov by decision, but I think that Cannoneer is a lot more experienced. He's a lot more weathered. You know, he's kind of seen it all, done it all. And I think that, you know, catching the younger guys coming up, sometimes they run into one that isn't quite ready to give up that spot yet. Um, Cannoneer hasn't looked bad. He just hasn't been doing what we expect him to do. Um, I I think that I think that Cannoneer gets it done. I think it's going to be a Cannoneer decision, it just based on the trends that that we've seen. Um, but I would absolutely sprinkle on this fight to not go to a decision. Um, I haven't looked at any of the odds or anything yet, so I'm not sure which is favored, if they still favor both of these guys to be finishers and it to not go to a decision. Uh, But if it's to go to a decision, absolutely uh, sprinkle on that if it's plus money. Uh, But I'm going to official pick. I'm going to go with Cannoneer by decision. I just feel like this one, I feel like it's, it's one of those fights where absolutely should be a finish, but... It's a main event that should be a finish. It's, it's, yeah, it's going to go to a decision because it just wouldn't make sense for these guys to go to a decision. Even though they've been doing nothing but decisions, we just feel like they're finishers and it's going to end within the distance. But I'm I'm going to I'm going to go against my gut instinct on this one. 
which I don't do very often. I'm going to say this is going to be a decision and I'm going to lean towards Cannoneer. No, and I agree. I, th I definitely see this going to the scorecards. What's interesting is just the similarity between the striking numbers between these two. They both hover around the four and a half significant strikes landed per minute. They both absorb strikes at a pretty similar clip. You know, Jared Cannonier at 4.13 per minute. Uh, Nasserdini Imovov at 3.26. The big difference for me is whether or not Imovov implements takedown attempts. Is if he gets Cannoneer thinking about the takedowns, that opens up some overhands, that opens up a little bit more striking, and I think that Imovov can eke out a decision. And I think that's what I'm going to go with. I, I love Jared Cannoneer. I really do. I think that he looked phenomenal against Marvin Vittori, and I think that he looked very good against Sean Strickland, and Sean Strickland was champion of the world. But, I mean, like we've been bringing it up, that Adesanya fight was just bad. There's no way around it. It was not a good performance, and I definitely see this one going to the scorecards because the trend has been for these fighters to take it to the scorecards. And we always talk about strength of schedule. These two have been going up against some insanely stiff competition that being said if we're going to expect finishes from these guys and they do have more finishes on their record than decisions both of them but it just it has not been the case recently which is it's interesting but i think it's going to keep up that way there you have it those those are our predictions for ufc fight night cannoneer versus imavov this one's fun this one goes under the radar a little bit. We've got some exciting, exciting pay-per-views coming up. Make sure you tune in for those episodes coming at the, coming at you in the near future. Make sure we're you gonna tune be, in. Uh, we're going to be hung over from from this weekend for this one. So this will be this will be our hair of the dog card. There it is. I love it. I love it. Make sure you tune in for this one. Saturday, June 8th, KFC Center in Louisville, Kentucky. Colonel Sanders is behind this card, so you should be too. <laughs> Until the next time, it has been so great hanging out with y'all in the fight pit. That is Matt. That's Drew. That's Sean. That's Gage. My name is Kyle. Until the next time, peace.